Hello, everyone. Hello. How are you this week? Time to begin a new week. And now we are on week number three. So it means that we are going to have just, um, in this case, three more days for this week number three. And then we are going to have just one more week. So we are almost, almost at the end of the course. And that is a very good um, thing because we are going to end one more module and we are going to continue with the process. But in, in this time, uh, we can say that it's really, really fast because it's not like we are in uh, thinking uh, that the time is very long. In this case, it's a very, very fast time. So we are beginning week number three. So we are going to start with the session number one of this uh, week number three. As, and you know that I like to share with you some um, phrases at the beginning of the week. So I will read the, uh, the phrase that I have for you today. And then we are going to continue with the topic that we were developing the last week. And in this case, it's the vocabulary that we were uh, uh, learning uh, about the geography. So now we are going to end with that part about the uh, vocabulary. And then we are going to continue with uh, another topic that is uh, kind of interesting, but also it's kind of um, long, but it's not like uh, hard to understand. It's it's kind of, of easy and you're going to enjoy the, the topic. So uh, we have the phrase and it says, do not be embarrassed by your failures. Learn from them and start again. Remember that when we are in a process, we have a lot of things to learn. So um, when we are learning a new language, it's like uh, we are going to think, uh, that something is kind of hard or we feel like uh, afraid of something and we think that we are not doing the things uh, very well. But in that case, you need to remember that you are learning. And it is not like just in the case that you are learning a new language. Uh, it's in every uh, moment of your life, uh, even in your work, in your house, in your daily life, you are learning something new. So in that case, you need to learn about the failure and start again and again and again. And then you are going to have your own uh, moments that you know that they are very worthy. So in that case, you need to keep in mind that you need to start again so many times. And that's the process of learning something new for our life. So the last week we were talking about a vocabulary uh, related to geography. I know that it's kind of mm, heavy to uh, hear the words, uh, read the meanings, and know what is the meaning in Spanish. But remember that we are learning a, a new language and we need to have knowledge about that. So in that case, we need to create this kind of vocabulary. And in this case, geography has a lot of words that we need to know. So now I'm going to continue with the list that we were uh, learning the last week. Uh, it's going to have like 20, or 26 words more. So I think it is not like very long because I'm going to write the word, the meaning, and the Spanish word. So in that case, it's the same process 
as we um, were writing the words in the last week. And then we are going to see the topic number two for uh, today's session. That is some comparison with adjectives. We are going to talk about adjectives. That is like a very, very interesting topic because we are um, talking about uh, words that we can use to give more information about someone, something, or um, a building or something like that. But in this case, we are going to know more about the adjectives and how to talk about comparison and all of the things. So we are going to uh, end the vocabulary part and then we are going to talk about some grammar uh, parts or some grammar topics. But in that case, it's not um, complicated to understand what are the comparison using adjectives. So we are going to continue because we have some words that we need to uh, write, and then we are going to explain the other topic. So we are going to start right now because it's just one hour to complete all the information that we have for this session. So we are going to start with the vocabulary that we have here in this space that we have in here. So we have here a lot of words that you can read every time uh, every time that you want because um, you have the access to the document uh, online so in that case when you want to read the words the meaning the spanish words you can uh, go to the link and read this vocabulary and if you need uh, some of these words to establish a conversation you have the whole information in here and even for the first topic that we were uh, learning uh, in the first week, you have all the information in the document. So we have here the words that we were learning in the last uh, session. And the last word that we have here is this one that is glaciar in Spanish, that is a slowly moving mass of ice. So we are going to continue for, uh, from that uh, noun. And we are going to have like 20 or 24, I guess. Five, 10, 12, 14, 15. Yeah, 20, 20 words um, that we are going to have about the geography uh, vocabulary. Remember that there are a lot of words that we can use in this topic, but in this case, uh, we are not going to have the whole vocabulary about geography because in some cases we can uh, find uh, some technical words, some specific words, and it's kind of complicated to remember all of those things. Así que vamos a terminar el vocabulario con algunas palabras más sobre geografía. No vamos a utilizar todo el vocabulario que podamos encontrar porque sería muy, muy, muy extenso. Y no sería en una o dos sesiones, sino tal vez en mucho más tiempo. Así que vamos a utilizar solo las palabras más comunes, no nos vamos a meter a palabras muy técnicas. Eh, porque eso ya sería un poco más avanzado, mucho más adelante. O si nosotros estamos muy interesados en el tema de geografía, in este caso, in English, we can use those words. But in this case, we are going to have just the most common words um, about geography. So the next word that we have here is goal. And goal means an arm of sea or ocean partly enclosed by land. And in Spanish, this means golfo. Then we have the next one that is hail. And it means precipitation of ice pellets.
And in Spanish, this means granizo. Then we have the next one that is hurricane. And it means a severe tropical cyclone, usually with heavy rains and wind. And in Spanish, it's kind of uh, the same, but with a different uh, pronunciation in Spanish is huracán. But uh, when we see the, uh, the word in English, we can know that what it means in Spanish because it has kind of the same. So it is not complicated to understand that hurricane is a huracán. Then we have hydrosphere. That this means the watery layer of the Earth's surface. And this means hydrosphere. Another one that is kind of the same. Then we have iceberg. A large frozen mass floating at sea. And it, it has the same, um, the same form in Spanish. It is not like Spanish, you know, but we know as iceberg. Then we have ESMA. And it means a narrow strip of land and connecting to low to larger land area. And this one means in Spanish is small. Is small. Then we have lake. But this means a body of, in this case, usually fresh water surrounded by land. And in Spanish, this means lago. Then we have marsh. But it means a low lying wetland with grassy vegetation. And in Spanish, this means pantano. Then we have a mist. 
a thin fog with condensation near the ground. And we have one that is a kind of same at the beginning of the vocabulary that is fog, uh, that is niebla. And in, in this case, we have a mist that in Spanish means neblina, que está más cerca del suelo. And in that case of a fog, it says, let me see. Let's see the uh, here. Fog. Droplets of water vapor is suspended in the air near the ground. Este está verdad suspendido en el aire cerca de el suelo, que es la niebla, pero es como más condensada, verdad? And in the case of this one, that is the mist, is um, una niebla delgada con un poco de eh, condensación cerca de eso. La otra como es un poco más eh, gruesa y esta es un poco más delgada. Then we have Monsoon. And it means uh, seasonal wine in Southern Asia. And in Spanish, it means monton. It has different letters, but it, at the end, it's almost uh, the same. Because in English, it, it's uh, monsoon, and in Spanish, it's monton. Then we have a mountain. And it means a land must projects well above its surroundings. And it means montaña. Then we have north. That is the direction corresponding to the northward cardinal uh, compass point. And in Spanish, this word means Norte. Then we have Oasis, that is the same here. So we have the same uh, word. And it means a shelter serving as a place of safety or sanctuary. They we have ocean, a large body of water that is part of the hydrosphere.
And it means oceano. Then we have peninsula. But it means It means a large mass of land projecting into a body of water. And this one is peninsula. But in this case, we have to write it like this. Then we have a breath. But this one is um, one of those words that is not like very, very uh, unknown because maybe we have some kind of uh, knowledge about um, this kind of words or we have seen a uh, in some places uh, that is very common to hear something about uh, this kind of word that is a reef or something related to the ocean or something like that. So in this case, we have uh, this word that means a submerged um, reach of rock or coral near the water's surface. And in Spanish, this means arrecife. And we are almost done. We have just four more words. Vamos a escribir solo cuatro palabras más que tengan que ver con el vocabulario eh, relacionado con geografía. Then we have a river. And it means a large natural of water. And this means Rio. Then we have sinkhole. And this means uh, a depression in the ground formed um, by underground erosion. And it means sumidero. Then we have a smog that is kind of a familiar this word because in some cases when you are um, hearing some news about the different places around the world and you are listening about the pollution and contamination, you can hear that word that is small. In some cases, that is um, a term that uh, in these places, in, in our countries, is kind of um, very common to hear that word also. It's not like we are going just to use the Spanish meaning, because in some cases we are uh, adapting our language uh, to that uh, kind of word. So in that case, we can hear that a uh, word a lot. So it's not like we are not uh, familiar with that a uh, word that is smog. In some cases, we don't know the, the meaning in Spanish or something like that, but we know that it is related to to pollution and to contamination and something like that. 
but we don't have a clear what is the meaning in Spanish. So in this case, we are going to know what is um, the translation for that word into Spanish. But first, we need to know what is the meaning. So in this case, it says air pollution by a mixture of smoke and fog. And it means we can use both a smog or we can use niebla toxica. So in that case, in Spanish, we can call it a niebla toxica because it is like a mixture of a smoke. It's una mezcla de, de humo y niebla, ¿verdad? Y que lleva mucha contaminación. In that case, it's a mixture of those words, smoke and fog, like smoke. That is a mixture of the name also. And then we have tsunami. And it means a cataclysm resulting for, from a destructive sea wave. And it also is called tsunami. Or is the, the, the best um, word that we, uh, we use for that uh, event. So here we have uh, the whole vocabulary that we have for uh, this uh, topic. If we can search, or if you can search a uh, vocabulary related to um, so geography, you are going to find a lot of words uh, that you can use uh, when you are talking about that kind of topic. Because in this case, it's like we are talking about um, some places in the earth, uh, some events. Um, when you are talking about pollution, when you are talking about population, uh, when you are talking about uh, some science or uh, studies that you have um, about the earth or something like that. So in that case, you're going to use this kind of word. But there are a lot of words related to that topic. And in this case, we have just the most common word. Uh, and I find, uh, or I mean, I found a very large um, a list of words, but in this case, I didn't uh, use all of those words because it's going to be very, very um, large in the vocabulary. But in this case, um, at the beginning, when we are um, in the first uh, what, courses, when we are learning English, uh, we find a uh, vocabulary very simple, like clothes, like animals, like food, like um, seasons, colors, and all of that thing. But when we are in uh, this kind of uh, courses, we are going to use new vocabularies uh, or different vocabularies related to uh, serious topics like this one. Uh, I know it, this kind of uh, vocabulary can be kind of boring or something like that. And it's very common to say something like that because in, even in Spanish, um, when we're talking about this kind of topics, uh, it's kind of boring. Uh, so in Spanish, you have like um, a subject related to this uh, kind of word. That is, estudios sociales. So in that case, uh, you know that many people uh, don't like that, that subject. 
but it's very, very necessary to have that kind of information and not even just for a talk to with someone. If you like to read or if you like to see some TV shows or if you like to see some documentaries related to the earth and it's kind of normal that you want to um, watch those TV shows in English because um, you are trying to um, feel more comfortable with the language and you're going to hear those words. Así que es bastante importante que um, aprendamos también este tipo de vocabulario que son un poco tediosos, un poco aburridos. Um, porque nos vamos a encontrar con muchas cosas que los van a llevar, ya sea documentales, programas de televisión, eh, libros. Because in my case, I have a book that is called Trojan Odyssey. Es como la Odisea Troyana, but it's not related to that history. Um, it's related to. Uh, Twins, a uh, twins, a uh, brother and sister that work um, with uh, something related to uh, the ocean and some uh, things like that. So in that book, you are going to find a lot of uh, technical words. And if you don't have the vocabulary or some knowledge about that kind of vocabulary, it can be hard to understand the story, and it is um, a very, very interesting one. Así que cuando, eh, en el caso de las personas que les gusta mucho la lectura y quieran comenzar a leer ya en inglés, eh, obviamente se va a hacer poco a poco, no es como que vamos a leer un libro de 300 páginas en, en un día o en menos tiempo, como estamos acostumbrados a hacerlo en nuestro idioma nativo. En inglés es un poco diferente porque hay palabras que no las tenemos en nuestro vocabulario. Y en el caso de este libro que, que ya les mencionaba, que es la Odisea Troyana, que no tiene nada que ver con la, con la Odisea, ¿verdad? Eh, que ya conocemos, eh, sino que es una historia que involucra a unos gemelos, a un hermano y una hermana, que tienen que ver con este tema de, de meteorología, del mar, de de huracanes y todo eso, en ese tipo de libros, las historias son muy buenas, pero en muchos de los casos no tenemos el vocabulario necesario para entenderle a la primera. So, in that case, we need to search, like we are reading, and then we stop and see um, a word that we didn't know what is the meaning, and we need to stop and search for the meaning, and we are like a very, very slow, um, Time. We are having like long periods of time in which we are like reading, then searching, then reading again, and then connecting the ideas, and so on. So for that reason, it's necessary that we have vocabulary related to uh, geography, geology, math, science, astronomy, and all of those things that we maybe think that they, they are very, very hard to, to learn. But in that case, it's very important for us to create that kind of vocabulary. In some moments, we are going to use those words. So, saying all of those things, we are going to end with the vocabulary. And now we are going to continue with the next topic that we are going to develop. And it is not like, we are going to um, have a more vocabulary. In this case, we are now um, understand how to use adjectives because we know um, and we have um, a lot of information related to the adjective because we know that we have numbers, we have colors, we have words related to the physical appearance, and we have a specific words that we can use uh, for talking about people. But in this case, we are going to talk about categories of adjectives. Ya tenemos conocimiento de los adjetivos, ya sabemos que son los adjetivos, 
sabemos cómo se utilizan, para qué se utilizan, qué tipo de adjetivos tenemos. Uh, but in this case, we are going to talk about categories. We are going to know how to create um, comparative adjectives and superlative adjectives. So we are going to see that topic right now. Vamos a hablar de los eh, adjetivos superlativos y los comparativos. So in that case, we are not just um, going to talk about the adjectives. So in this case, we are going to talk about these two categories. So we have here an image uh, related to the topic. And the topic is a comparison with adjectives. But we are going to see the comparative ones and the superlative ones. So we have Sam is taller than George, but Andrew is the tallest in the family. So we have that example and we have the image with the names of the people or the boys that we are talking about. So we have the first sentence that is Sam is taller than George. Y tenemos Tom es más alto que Jorge o okay, que George. En ese caso estamos haciendo una comparación de las estaturas. Tom is taller than George. Ya lo vemos, ¿verdad? En la imagen que Tom es mucho más alto que George. But Andrew is the tallest in the family. That is the superlative one. Nadie supera a Andrew. Andrew es el más alto de la familia. So in that case, we are talking about the superlative. No one is taller than Andrew. So in that case, he is the tallest in the family. So we are going to write what is an adjective because it is necessary to remember uh, that information. Then we are going to begin with the comparative adjective. Uh, what is the use for this comparative adjective? We have some formulas. Uh, then we have some examples. Uh, we have some cases in which we need to pay attention to the use of this uh, adjective. Then we are going to talk about the superlative adjectives. And we are going to see the one syllable adjective, two syllable adjective, and all of the things. And tomorrow we are going to see some list of adjectives, and then we are going to have some uh, exercises because we need to put into practice all the information that we have. So, we are going to begin with the uh, definition. Vamos a comenzar con la definición. And we have the uh, thing that we are going to learn. Adjectives. And it says, adjectives are words. We're going to write it like this. Are words that describe identify or quantify nouns and pronouns. They help specify or write in by offering more details about nouns and pronouns. So in that case we have que los adjetivos son palabras que obviamente nosotros ya sabíamos esta información que describe, identifica o cuantifica los nombres y los pronombres. En este caso, ¿verdad? Nos está ayudando a modificar nombres y pronombres. Nos ayudan a especificar en nuestro, en la escritura, ¿verdad? Cuando nosotros escribimos y ofrecen más detalles acerca de quiénes, de los nombres y los pronombres. Obviamente siempre nos va a ofrecer muchos más detalles de los nombres o pronombres que utilizamos 
cuando hacemos oraciones o cuando hablamos de ciertas personas. Then we have the comparative adjective. And it says comparative adjectives are used to compare two things. They help describe differences between two nouns. So in this case, when we are going to use the comparative adjective, we are just um, compare two nouns. Vamos a comparar nada más dos nombres. Sí podríamos comparar más, pero en este caso lo vamos a poner de esta forma. Eh, vamos a comparar dos. Vamos a hacer una comparación que sea bastante notable, bastante obvia, entre dos nombres o dos pronombres o dos personas. Así como lo tenemos en el ejemplo, Tom is taller than George, donde decimos que Tom es más alto que George. Estamos haciendo notar esa diferencia que hay entre las estaturas. So in that case, we are going to use the comparative adjectives to compare two things, and also they are helping us to describe differences between two nouns. And we have a formula. Aquí sí vamos a tener varias fórmulas o varias estructuras eh, de cómo podemos utilizar estas eh, comparative adjectives o el de superlative adjective. So, we have the comparative adjective sentence formula to create sentence in which we are going to compare two things. So we have here, comparative adjectives are generally used in the following sentence structure. So it is the, the, the most common way in which we can use these comparative adjectives. So we have here this one that is first the noun, and in this case is the subject plus the verb plus the comparative adjective. Plus then plus the noun, that in this case, this second noun is the object of the sentence. So in this case, this is the formula that we are going to use to create our sentence. Here. So we have the noun, the first noun, because in this case, you can see that we have two nouns in the structure. The first noun is the subject plus the verb plus the comparative adjective plus then, in this case, plus the noun that is the second one that is the object of the sentence. So we have some examples to 
uh, but into practice, this structure. So we have here the examples. We are going to use this one. And it says, my television is here bigger than my computer. That is the structure that we are following. First one, my, in that case, my television, because I am dividing this one in this, in this case, I don't have to divide it. My television is the uh, first noun that is the subject. My television plus verb, in this case, verb to be, is, be, be is the adjective. So in this case, we are transforming the adjective into a comparative one. And we have bigger, plus than, plus my computer, that is the second noun or object. Así que ahí tenemos el ejemplo siguiendo la estructura, donde tenemos que mi televisor es el primer sujeto, o sea, el primer nombre. Luego el verbo to be, en este caso is, para tercera persona. Luego tenemos nuestro adjetivo, que ahí ya está eh, cambiado, para que sea un adjetivo comparativo, bigger. Luego tenemos then, que es el que nos va a ayudar a hacer la comparación entre las dos cosas. Y my computer, que es el segundo nombre o el objeto. My television is bigger than my computer. Mi televisión es más grande que mi computadora. So that is the example following the structure that we have here. And it says, in some cases, the sentence will end after the comparative adjective and not include the object of comparison. This structure is possible when the context has provided enough information to make the comparison clear. Tenemos Diferentes formas de expresar nuestras ideas, ¿verdad? Esta es como la más genérica donde eh, ponemos dos ¿verdad? nombres eh, y explicamos la diferencia que hay entre ellos. Pero en algunos casos no vamos a poner el objeto de la oración porque en este caso ya hemos dado un contexto antes eh, donde ya tenemos información de lo que nos referimos. En este caso, no vamos a completar la oración. Y en este caso, I'm going to give here another example. And I'm going to use this one based on a previous context. Maybe we are talking with someone and we are talking on a specific topic and we have knowledge about the situation or the things that someone is telling us. So in that case, it is not necessary to follow the structure. And we have here the example and it says, my brother is six feet tall. My brother is six feet tall. But my father is taller. So here, in this case, we have here this structure. My father is taller. Mi padre es más alto. ¿De quién? ¿De quién estábamos hablando en la oración en este caso? De su My hermano. Brother. Oh, uh -huh. estamos hablando del hermano. My brother is six feet tall, but my father is taller. Mi padre es más alto que mi hermano. In that case, we don't know. I mean, we don't need to add the information again. Ya no necesitamos 
agregarla de nuevo esa información porque ya la sabemos. So in this case, I'm going to write it outside the example. Then my brother. En el caso de que no tuviéramos la primera parte, this one, let me mark this in this one. So, in this case, si no tuviéramos esa primera parte, my brother is six feet tall, en este caso yo sí debería de agregar toda la información para hacer la oración comparativa. My father is taller than my brother. Estaría bien. Pero como yo ya hablé de mi hermano primero, my brother is six feet tall, but my father is taller. Siempre estoy haciendo la comparación entre los dos, entre el papá y el hijo, para decir quién de los dos es más alto. Pero como yo ya agregué la información al principio, yo ya no necesito agregar nada más, porque ustedes ya saben a quién se refiere la oración. So in that case, we can have these two different type of sentences. Excuse okay. me, Miss. Tell me. And then uh, we, can, we can put um, to him o para de él, o sea, como ya estamos haciendo referencia a él en el principio, ya no es necesario poner que el papá es más alto que él, que el hermano. No, ya no es necesario, porque como está cerca, en el caso de que la oración sea mucho más larga y que ya hayamos dado la información, my brother is six, uh, six feet tall, but I have someone else that uh, can be different and my father is taller than him. Si ya le agregamos más información en el medio, ya le podemos poner como un recordatorio de a quién nos referíamos, sin ponerle than my brother, pero sí referirnos a él. Pero si en ese caso, inmediatamente después de haber dado la información de mi hermano pongo a mi padre, ya no necesito ponerle nada más. En ese caso quedaría solo my father is father y ahí se termina. Pero si yo hablo, ¿verdad? De mi hermano al principio y sigo hablando y sigo hablando but, y, y recuerdo, but my father is taller. La, el, el oyente se va a perder y ahí sí lo podemos conducir y decir than my brother o than him o the name, por ejemplo. Pero si acabamos de dar la información de quién estamos refiriéndonos, que en ese caso sería nuestro objeto de la oración, ya no es necesario que lo agreguemos. Sí, en el caso de que hagamos más larga nuestra oración, sí. Solo como recordatorio, pero ya no es tan necesario. Ok, thank you. You're welcome. So, we're going to he, uh, have here just the structure for the comparative. We are going to see the superlative, but this is not the end for the comparative uh, adjective. We are just going to see the um, structure for the superlative. Then we are going to have like um, a mixture of comparative and superlative because we are going to see the, um, the list of adjectives and how to transform those adjectives into comparative and into superlative because of the ending are of the suffix of the word. Vamos a ver las estructuras de los superlativos, pero no nos vamos a olvidar de los comparativos. Uh, mañana vamos a ver la lista de adjetivos de los más comunes, no vamos a ver toda la lista porque son un montón, pero sí vamos a ver como una lista que eh, tenga un par de, de adjetivos y cómo transformar nuestros adjetivos la forma base de nuestros adjetivos a superlativo y a comparativo por los suffix, los sufijos, los finales de los adjetivos. Pero ahorita solo vamos a ver the structures. Tomorrow we are going to end with that topic. Now we are just going to see the structures. So, we have the superlative. It says superlative adjectives are used to compare three or more things. They help describe things on either end of a spectrum. 
smallest and largest, tallest and shortest. Aquí sí vamos a eh, utilizar tres o más cosas que podamos eh, nosotros poner en una lista. Let's see. Of course, you have the information in the link. Ustedes tienen el, el enlace. Yo no borro los documentos. Los documentos están ahí en Google Docs y ustedes eh, entran al enlace que yo ya les envié al grupo y ustedes van viendo toda la información. Se va actualizando según yo vaya escribiendo. Así que toda la información ustedes la tienen ahí y ustedes la pueden seguir viendo incluso después del módulo porque yo no borro los los documentos que tengo en Google Docs. Ustedes pueden seguir entrando y viendo la información que está ahí. ¿Y las grabaciones? Eh, ¿Dónde las podemos encontrar? Um, las grabaciones de las clases. I will send to you the link of where the... Le voy a mandar el, el enlace del... Uh, de, donde, de donde estoy subiendo los, los videos, que es el... el a donde se reproducen la lista de reproducción de los okay. videos porque no sé si se los enviaron en el correo pero yo se los voy a mandar al grupo más tarde y mis, eh, yo le preguntaba porque este yo me, no estuve en unas clases uh -huh. una, las experiencias que tuve entonces si yo entré al link que usted mandó y ah, de hecho ahí voy siguiendo la clase porque en el teléfono me cuesta muchísimo ver. Sí, <ríe> pero en ese caso, por eso prefiero hacerlo así, que sea en Google Docs, porque ahí ustedes van entrando en el momento que quieran y se va actualizando y no tienen que descargar nada en su teléfono, sino que ustedes entran directamente a la web sin tener incluso instalado algún programa X y ustedes van viendo ahí la información. Sí, gracias. Es que eso quería saber si se iba a borrar ya después terminando el módulo. Ya no, iba a no, no, para ingresar. nada. Ahí va a quedar la información siempre. Gracias, Miss. You're welcome. So, we are going to end with this part. It is said, superlative adjectives are used to compare three or more things They help to describe and we have the example, a small f. The smallest or largest. And tallest and shortest. So in this case, uh, we're saying that, that we are making a comparison between uh, three or more things, but in this case, it's not right. Um, with the comparative adjectives, in this case, it's like you can see three different things, and then you are going to find what is the most, um, or uh, what is in the first place. En este caso, el comparativo no sirve. Sí vamos a comparar, pero es hacer como una lista de las cosas y ver cuál es el más, que nada lo supera en el más corto, en el más largo, en el más alto, en el más pequeño, eh, o algo por el estilo, pero que nadie se este, compare a esa eh, descripción que le estamos dando. So in that case, it's not like a comparison, but you need to have information or two, three or more things in which you can eh, have a list and then you're going to have your um, own places, for example. So, Tomorrow we are going to end with this part of the uh, superlative adjective, and then we are going to see the list and all of the things. So we are going to end the session here, and we are going to see each other uh, tomorrow.
and I will send to you the um, link for the uh, reproduction list on YouTube in which you can see the videos that we have about the classes. So have a really good night and see you tomorrow. Thank you, teacher. Good, good night. 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 Take care. Good night.